So in last week's classes and the corresponding videos, we talked about the central question of meta-ethics, which is where does morality come from? What is the ultimate source of morality? Is it culture, God, is morality irreducible? Uh, there's a variety of options that we looked at. Uh, in this week, uh, we'll talk about nor the central question of normative ethics, which is roughly, what are the most general moral rules or guidelines? Uh, we'll start off by talking about Immanuel Kant's view on this, and then we'll talk about John Stuart Mill's view on this. This gives us kind of the two most uh, widely explored approaches to guidelines. One's called a deontological approach, and the other is called a consequentialist approach. Um, you can associate the former with Kant and the latter with Mill. So as I said, we're going to start off talking about Kant. Here's a kind of rough overview of what we'll go through. We'll talk about the uh, intuitions Kant thinks we have about particular moral cases, and then we'll look at the lessons you can learn from those intuitions, or lessons Kant thinks you can learn from those intuitions about what the most general moral rules or guidelines are. That will occur as we talk about what actions are like and get to the conclusion that moral worth of an action comes from the rule that you're applying when you act. Then we'll look at what kind of rule makes an action morally praiseworthy and what kind of violation of rule makes an action morally bl blameworthy. Uh, then we'll sort of identify the most general moral rule or guideline, the sort of general principle that we're looking for. And then we'll look at some objections to Kant's view. So let's start with uh, Kant's uh, talk of intuitions. Now, you can Kant has a particular, has something in particular in mind uh, when he uses the word intuition. We're not using the word necessarily in the way he is. Um, I, the point here is just that when you're presented with a sort of moral case, you often have a kind of intuitive reaction or some judgment that you're just inclined to make by default. So you don't need to reflect for a half hour sometimes to decide whether something is morally praiseworthy or blameworthy or neither. Instead, you just kind of have a quick automatic reaction that seems right to you. That's what we're talking about when we talk about moral intuitions or default moral judgments. So here's a kind of case Kant gives, and he asks you to have a reaction. So what you're going to do here is I'm going to describe a case, and you're just supposed to see how you react to the question I ask about the case at the end of the case. So this is a shopkeeper. That's why the sweatshirt uh, says S. And along comes a child, and the child says, look, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, how much is this loaf of bread? My mom gave me $20 to spend on the bread. And the shopkeeper thinks as follows. I could cheat this boy very easily, but then he's going to tell his parents and then they won't shop here. Um, and they'll tell other people not to shop here and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, I'll end up uh, losing business. So that's what the shopkeeper thinks. And the shopkeeper thinks, given that I'll lose business if I charge the full $20 for the loaf of bread, even though it's really only three, I'd better go ahead and charge the appropriate amount. So the shopkeeper says that will be $2.75, and uh, the boy gets his correct change and gets his loaf of bread. And here's a question. Is the shopkeeper's action morally praiseworthy? Now, the action at issue is charging the correct amount for the loaf of bread. And what I want you to do is pause here and just see what your judgment is. Would you look at this shopkeeper's action, given that you know the full description, you know the, the reasoning that he went through, and say, wow, that was really good. The shopkeeper did a good thing there by charging the correct amount. Okay, now here's another case. We have someone waiting for a bus and uh, someone else comes along with a walker and the person with the walker falls and this person thinks, uh, she thinks helping this person is the right thing to do. And because of that thought, she gets up and she goes to help the person. But as she's on her way to help the person, a car comes along, swerves out of the way of the person on the ground, and knocks, you know, kills her dead. And she consequently didn't get to help the person. Um, and here's the question. Is Blue's action morally praiseworthy? That is, would you look at what she did, her going to help the person and say, that was a morally good thing to do. Her action was morally good, um, even though she didn't manage to succeed, even though she didn't manage to get there and help. Now here's another case, and again, you're supposed to sort of pause and think, what do I want to say about this? Um, here's another case. You have somebody come along and say, uh, you know, this is the, the kid with the bread, comes along and somebody says, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to the nearest market? And the kid says, if I help her, that will make me feel good. 
so I'm going to help her. Um, and she says, then, sure, just ahead to the right. And this is the truth. So she says where the market is. And she does so because it will make her feel good. And we can ask again of this case, is Green's action morally praiseworthy? It was a morally good thing to do to give the right directions, given that the motivation was to feel good. And here's a final, and again, I want you to pause and sort of think, how do I react to this? Do I say, yes, it's morally praiseworthy, or am I not inclined to say yes? And now here's a final case. Um, you have your machine here. This is supposed to be a robot that someone has programmed a certain way. And this blue person in blue comes along and says, I'm from out of town. Can you tell me how to get to the closest bus stop? And the machine goes through the following internal procedure. If input is question, output is correct answer. The 63 stop is just back uh, to, the, to the left a little bit and then says that the 63 bus stop is just back to the left a little bit. And uh, the person says thanks and then goes off and makes the bus. And here's a question. Is the robot's action morally praiseworthy? So here's a final case. You have your shopkeeper and someone, this shopkeeper runs into the person looking for the bus and says, I'm from out of town. Can you tell me how to get to the closest bus stop? And the shopkeeper thinks, always deceive people. That's what you ought to do. Um, the 63 bus stop is just back to the left a little bit and then says, that's really far. Just head to the right and you'll get there in a few miles. And the person says thanks and heads on her way. And here's a question. Is the shopkeeper's action in this case morally praiseworthy? It seems obvious in this case that the action is not morally praiseworthy. At any rate, uh, let's now consider a question, another question. Why do intuitions matter? So Kant is going to take these intuitions that we just had about these cases and try and come up with a moral principle, a general moral principle that predicts each of your responses, that says for each case you said the action is morally praiseworthy, that it is, and for each case that you said it isn't, that it isn't. So it, it predicts those reactions and explains why those reactions are correct. But here's a question. Why should we think the reactions are correct? You just had some judgments about cases. Why should we think those judgments are reliable? And there's a variety of answers to, these, to this question. We'll consider one. So take linguistics. Linguists often build theories uh, by systematizing our grammatical intuitions. So they'll look at a bunch of expressions in language, like who went uh, to the store? How much money did, did she have? There were six candles that she bought, and so on. And then look at a variety of other expressions, like uh, bed, sheets, mud, of it, went, and went to the store, did he, and so on and so forth. And they'll take the ones that we think are grammatically correct and the ones that we think aren't grammatically correct, and then look for a general grammar that can explain and predict which ones we'll say are, predict which ones we'll say correct are correct and which ones we'll say aren't, and explain why the correct ones are correct and why the incorrect ones are correct. And that raises a comparable question, which is, why should we take our grammatical intuitions, our judgments about these cases, seriously? Why should we think we have a reliable faculty that allows us to judge these kinds of cases? And in the case of grammar, there's an answer that some people have offered that seems pretty plausible. And it's this, that you kind of have grammar built into you. There's a sort of generative theory of grammar that's built into your brain. And uh, this generative theory uh, allows you to produce sentences that follow its rules and it allows you to recognize sentences that follow its rules and allows you to recognize sentences that don't follow its rules. So the idea is your kind of intuitive judgments are a reliable guide because the theory uh, at issue is inside you. And philosophers have said similar things about uh, why intuitions and philosophy should matter. So in the Gettier case, if you recall, we describe a case where someone has a justified true belief that intuitively doesn't amount to knowledge. And there's a question, why should you take your intuition about whether it's knowledge or not seriously? And one answer is that, look, uh, you're investigating your concept of knowledge and your word knowledge. So how you think it applies is bound to be correct because the sort of correctness condition, what makes the application correct is inside you. It's your concept or the word, that, you know, the, the meaning that you're expressing or something like this. That's one view of why intuitions matter. It's not the only view. Um, but suppose you have a view along these lines, then you might say Kant's correct to take our intuition seriously. Why? Because there's a 
sort of moral theory that's built into us. And by investigating our intuitive reactions to cases, we can figure out what those kind of, what the general principle of that moral theory is. Okay, um, that's all I'm going to say about intuitions for now. We're going to come back to intuitions uh, as we build Kant's theory. But in order to see how he's going to make use of intuitions, we need to see how he thinks actions work. And we'll look at that in the next video.